In this section, we now want to talk about dimension tables. So a dimension table we have learned we want to use to slice and dice our data. But now let's have a closer look at these dimensions. We have learned that a dimension table always needs a primary key. And in this case, we can see that there is a natural key, which is coming straight out of the source system. But this is not the best way of a primary key. We should rather replace those primary keys and use surrogate keys. This is usually an integer number that is just increasing one by one. And this has, as we have learned, more benefits. And therefore, we should rather use these surrogate keys. And then also the question is, do we need to keep those original natural keys, yes, we can, but oftentimes it is also not necessary. But what we should do is we want to have usually a lookup table. So this is just giving the reference of our key, so our created surrogate key and the natural key. So this is done very easily. We can just query in SQL the distinct values of this product ID, the natural key, and then just populate a sequence next to that. That is very easy in SQL or also the other ETL tools. But now the question that you might have is, how can we now create the correct reference from our fact table to this dimension table if we use this surrogate keys. Because of course we need to have the correct reference. For example, in here in the fact table, which is originally coming out of the source system, we see we have still this natural key. But we can now use this lookup table, for example, or if we have just still both the surrogate and the natural key in our table, then we can just create a join. And this is also something that is not so complicated. So for example, a join in SQL would look something like this. So we want to start with the original fact table. So all of the attributes that we have already created and transformed. So this replacement of this natural key in our fact table is usually the last step after we have done all of the transformations in our fact table. And now we can just use all of that columns that we have created and then we can just add the value from this product table. So we use a join for that. In our case, we can use a left join from this sales fact table to this product dimension. And in this case, we can also name them, give them aliases, so P and S. So like this, we can just call the column names more easily. And then we, of course, create the join based on those two columns. So we want to use the product ID, which is now in our lookup table or also possibly our dimension. And then we want to use also from the sales table this order line ID. And then we can create the matches and use now all of these surrogate key values and add them also into our fact table. So like this, we could just replace all of these values, for example, P034 with just the value 34 which we get out of our product table or the lookup table. But don't worry, this is just one example of how this can be done. There can be also other ways, but a very common way is to just use a join. In our case, of course, we could have also just removed this P and then maybe also just transformed it into an integer number. But as mentioned, a common way is just a left join. And then if we have that, we get the final result and we have now all of these correct references to our dimension table. And then with that dimension table, we can create now the correct reference from this product primary key that is now referenced 
in our fact table and of course needs to refer to the correct values. So in this case we have sunglasses TR7 so this is the order line one and this is referencing to the correct product name and also the related attributes such as category, subcategory and so on. So like this we don't need to keep the sunglasses this name and all of the other attributes but we can just remove it from the fact table and just use all of the attributes in our dimension table. And with that structure the dimension tables usually have not so many rows but usually it is a very wide table. So we have many columns with all of the different descriptive attributes. And this is of course more powerful if there are long text values and this is especially then helpful if we have many descriptive attributes. And of course now we have learned that this dimension table is now used to group and filter our data. So it's also called slice and dice the data. And this can mean then that we can just use some of the attributes of our dimension. So for example, the product name and group the data like this. And this is then of course the entry point for our data analysis. And that's why these dimensions are so important. And now that we have talked about that dimension tables, we want to dive a little bit deeper and talk about the most important and most commonly used dimension, which is the date dimension. The date dimension is the most commonly used dimension. It is almost available in all of our processes and therefore we almost in all cases in a data warehouse do have a date dimension available. And it's also one of the most important aspects in our dimensional analysis because we want to measure the performance usually over time and across the different date dimensional aspects. And therefore it is one of the most important if not the most important dimension. And it contains as I've mentioned all of the date related features that we want to analyze. So examples for that could be the year, the month and be aware that it can be the month name and also the month number and also additional attributes such as the day in the month, the quarter, the week, the day in the week and again in the name as a text and also again as a number. So Monday could be one, Tuesday could be two and so on. So this is what the features are in our date dimension. And we've also learned that one thing is particular about the state dimension, which is the surrogate key, which is not a number without any meaning that is just increasing step by step with one value, but it's usually a more meaningful surrogate key that consists just out of the year, month and the day. So in that format it is usually the primary key in the date dimension. So like this 2022 2nd of April is becoming this integer key and this is then the primary key of our date dimension. Commonly we also have an extra row in our date dimension so we should usually always have that and this is just representing a dummy value if there is no date value in our fact table. Because in our fact table in the foreign keys we should not have null values or missing values. And oftentimes in the source there can be null values and therefore we need to replace them with a foreign key that is just referring or referencing a dummy date value. So this could be a very early day. So for example 1900 1st of January. And like this we have the referential integrity and all of the relationships work well. So this is what we should do in our date dimension. But now what we should also note is that if the time aspect is also important. So just imagine you have also a timestamp next to the date in the source system. Then this should be usually a separate dimension. 
So if this granularity of the time is also important, which is not always the case, but then we can also just separate the time from the date and also create a separate time dimension. And the date dimension is one of the few dimensions which are very calculatable. So it's very predictable and we can therefore populate this table in advance also for days in the future that do not yet exist in our fact table. So of course in the fact table the future events are not recorded yet but still we can populate also for the next years this date dimension. But now let's have a look at some example of a date dimension. We should include, and these are things that we should keep in mind, both numbers and text. So for example, January as month name and one as the first month in the year. Then we should also include long and abbreviated names. Again, this is not a must, but is depending on the business use case. But we should consider both of these options in our data warehouse. So if the business users want to have these abbreviated names in their reportings, then of course we should also populate that in our date dimension. And also we can have combinations of attributes. So for example, we can not only keep the quarter itself, but also the combination of 2022 Q1. And then the users can just use this feature to group the data by. And this makes it easier for the end user if they have already those specific features available and ready to use that they need. Also something that we can populate on top of that is some fiscal date. So for example, the fiscal year. And last but not least, we also oftentimes have some flags. So a flag is something that is indicating if some value is true or not. So for example, is it a weekend or not? Is it holidays or not? And like this, we can also analyze the data with these flags or these yes and no features. But now let's have a look at one example of such a day table. We can see we have first of course the primary key, then we have also the original date, which is of course the first thing that we want to think about. So this is the most common thing that is usually always available. And also note that the different formats it's not so important to keep those different formats. So if we have a hyphen or a backslash or whatever, this is something that we usually rather do in the BI application. So in that case, we only store the value as a date data type and then all of the formatting we can do later on in then the BI application. And then also we have a combination, one abbreviated value, and in the end also we have a flag. This is then indicating if it is a weekend. So for example, Saturday is a weekend and then Sunday of course also is a weekend and therefore it has also the value one. Whereas Monday is not weekend, therefore has the value zero. And also note that here I have used one and zero. So one is indicating yes and zero is indicating no, which has some advantages because it can be aggregated. We can calculate the sum, but also it is not so user friendly. And if it is not so clear to the end users, it is better to use understandable words. So for example, we can say weekend or weekday. So just in plain text. But both of these options work and we should also just consider the business users and the reporting requirements for that. So this is the most important dimension, the date dimension. We've already talked about nulls in our fact tables and therefore we now also want to talk about nulls in the dimensions. But before we do that, we want to quickly recap what we've learned about the nulls so far. So first we've learned that nulls must be avoided at all costs basically in foreign keys. We can easily do that by just replacing those nulls with a dummy value, for example, negative one. 
If we don't do that, so if we would keep those nulls in the foreign keys that are used to create joints or relationships to our dimension tables, we would break the referential integrity. And then those values would basically disappear if we want to join this to the dimension tables. So we would then lose the values for these facts and this would look something like this. Imagine we want to have this broken down by the promotion type. So we create a join or a relationship to this promotion dimension and then we group by the promotion type. If we would use the nulls, we would just not see all of these values with the nulls because they disappear in the joins. And therefore we should rather use negative one, for example, or any other dummy value. And in that way, the user will still see then if they want to group by the promotion type, this no promo. So of course then in the dimension table, we should also keep one row where this dummy value is also of course not null, but it has a descriptive value, for example, no promo. Or if we are talking about the date dimension, we should also just use one dummy value. Of course, this needs to be with the same data type as the column and therefore if it's a date column as in the date table then it can be for example 1st of January 1900. So it is in the same data type as this entire column here. So that is what we need to know about the nulls and be aware that nulls can be present in the facts themselves. So for example, if we in general have never sales in the weekend because our stores are closed, then it would not make sense to use zero because this would just screw the average. So the average would appear then lower as it is in general in the times when the store is open. And therefore we can have potentially nulls in the fact tables. So they work pretty well with the aggregations such as sum, such as average. And therefore this can be present in the facts and we don't need to replace them necessarily. So this is about the fact tables. And now about the dimensions, let's also quickly recap that. We should, if there are any nulls in the dimensions, replace them always with descriptive values. For example, a descriptive value could be something like no promotion available, no category available. And also of course for the date, we have a dummy value such as 1st of January 1900. And the reason for that is that you want to avoid that the business users don't understand what this null means because the null is not really descriptive and can mean anything. No promotion available is much more descriptive. And then also the users can decide themselves if the value should appear in their aggregation, in their grouping, in their graphs or not. If it would be a null, it would just by default disappear and would not be shown in the graphs that are created in these BI tools. And therefore we have more options with these descriptive values for the end users and it is also more understandable for the end users. So therefore in the dimensions just also replace the nulls and if possible use dummy values such as the 1900 or descriptive values if there is a null initially in the fact table. So this is how we should deal with null attributes in dimensions.